Hello, welcome back to the Squawk YouTube channel. I'm, of course, Statman Dave, and today we're looking at the big one. That, of course, is Chelsea versus Arsenal in the Europa League final. It's time for Squawker Tactics. Let's dive in. It's the first of the all-English European finals, Chelsea versus Arsenal in Baku. This is the second time that two English clubs have played each other in the final of this competition. And it takes the total number of finalists from England to 16. This is joint level with Spain, Italy a third with 15, and Germany fourth with 14. Interestingly, France who are considered part of the exclusive top five European leagues, have never had a winner of this competition and are ranked seventh for finalists behind both Netherlands and Portugal. Back to this game, and I don't think I need to tell you what a grudge match this is for both clubs. Bitter rivals from the city of London battling it out in Baku for European glory. On that note, we have to mention the poor organisation from UEFA for this final. Both clubs were allocated 6,000 tickets and returned half of them unsold. Fans have been unable to either afford or navigate the almost 3,000 mile distance with no flights from London to Baku that are direct. Add to that the political issues that have forced Arsenal player Henrik Mkhitaryan to sit out the game. It doesn't paint a great picture. I think most fans understand the need to share finals fairly around European football federations, but this shouldn't affect their ability to follow their team or the on-pitch spectacle. As the designated home side, let's look at Chelsea first. As usual with this club, we've got to look at the managerial situation first to understand what's happening on the pitch. Maurizio Sarri has had what most football observers would consider a satisfactory first season in the Premier League. Not spectacular, but taking his side in transition to third place and a European final is pretty decent. Obviously, not all Chelsea fans are happy with him overall. There have been heavy defeats, questions about his style and man management. This would seem to have cost him his job, meaning this potentially is his last game in charge as Chelsea manager. Rumours of a move back to Syria with Juventus have kept running since Allegri announced he was leaving Turin. Sarri isn't the only one potentially involved for the final time with Chelsea. It's widely expected that Eden Hazard will join Real Madrid this summer. In better news for the club, Olivier Giroud has recently signed a one-year extension and expect him to lead the line ahead of Gonzalo Higuain. Giroud is joint top scorer in the Europa League this season with 10 goals, alongside Luka Jovic. Chelsea also have the competition's joint top assist maker in Willian with seven. On the injury front, Sarri has confirmed that Antonio Rudiger is out, alongside the talented youngsters hudson Adoy and Loftus-Cheek. Worryingly for Chelsea fans, doubts exist over Angulo Kante's fitness. He missed a training session and at the time of recording is due to have a late fitness test to see whether he can start. Anyway, let's dive into the Chelsea tactics. Sarri will continue with the 4-3-3 for this final, a system that he's played throughout the season. There is questions whether he should slightly tweak that system for the Premier League, but if he's off to Juve, it doesn't really matter. In terms of the guys where there's a few sort of positional problems for Chelsea, of course, Angulo Kante in central midfield. The knee injury means that he could miss out. It'd be a massive loss to Chelsea. He's been one of the best players in the Premier League over the last few seasons. What he's added to his game under Sarri is that ability to get into the final third and contribute with goals and assists. But in terms of the replacements that could be brought in if Angulo Kante is not fit, the main man that would be coming in would be Ross Barkley. Probably the best option you'd expect uh, him to play on the left side and Kovacic on the right hand side. What that could give Chelsea in the final third is a little bit more creativity, um, although Kovacic is renowned for retaining possession. Barkley could be playing a little bit ahead, uh, you know, moving into the attacking midfield position a little bit more frequently than, of course, Kovacic. We started to see with Kante dropping a little bit deeper to help Jorginho out because teams have been isolating the Regista at the base of their midfield. Other concerns for Chelsea fans potentially is who's going to play up front? Is it going to be Gonzalo Higuain or Olivier Giroud? I'd probably go with Olivier Giroud. 10 goals in the Europa League, you've got to back him. I think the best thing about Olivier Giroud is the combination play with Eden Hazard. Hazard does really well when he's playing with a target man. We saw that frequently in his Chelsea career, the likes of Diego Costa, doing well with Hazard in the team, playing off each other, sliding each other through, arguably playing as a bit of a two-man strike force, push that left-hand side. So I'd probably go with Giroud over Gonzalo Higuain, a player that's not really hit the heights that we expected when he joined the Premier League, but of course could be an option off the bench if Sarri wants to go with more of a traditional poacher than a target man. But we'll throw, of course, Olivier Giroud in there. The tactical thing for Sarri is whether to go for either Pedro or Willian. 
I'd probably start with Willian and then look to bring Pedro on if they're looking for a goal. We all know that Pedro is probably a little bit more of a goal scorer than Willian is, and we expect him to make more runs into the penalty area. Whereas Willian, more of a traditional winger, will look to hit the byline and create for the rest of his teammates. Seven assists in the Europa League, a pretty decent record. The last little bit we've got to talk about for Chelsea is at centre-back. Christensen is expected to come in to deputise because Rudiger is out injured. But a real frustration with Rudiger this season, really good on the cover, a fantastic player, but a little bit too safe on the ball for Sarri's style. Whereas, of course, David Luiz is a little bit too direct for Sarri. You really need a player that can go short and long if you want to get the best out of Sarri ball. Koulibaly was fantastic at doing that at Napoli. Luiz, Rudiger, probably not the correct options, and I would have liked to see more of Christensen this season. That could be a slight criticism for Maurizio Sarri. Arsenal had a Champions League place in their grasp via the Premier League and somehow managed to throw it away with three defeats and a draw in their final five league games. This gives the game such gravitas, and now it's the only route back into Europe's Premier competition. Similar to Sarri, Emery has had what would appear to be a satisfactory but unspectacular first season in the Premier League, finishing fifth and getting to a European final, but this hasn't stopped grumblings amongst the Gunners fan base. Emery is the Europa League king, winning the competition three times in a row with Sevilla. A win this time would move him ahead of Giovanni Trapattoni in the list of the competition's most successful managers, of course considering the Europa League and UEFA Cup. But his mind will be more focused on the potentially era-defining roles this game plays for the Gunners. Win it and the summer acquisitions and direction next year will be very different compared to if they're back in the Europa League next season. On the selection front, Emery is expected to stick with his Europa League keeper, Petr Cech. It's an unusual situation for Cech, who's expected to rejoin Chelsea in an organisational capacity after the final game with Arsenal. It's a measure of the man and his integrity that no serious questions have arose about this potentially awkward situation. The main injury news for Arsenal is then another player leaving the club this summer. Danny Welbeck is expected to make the bench after not playing since his serious injury last November. So let's dive into the Arsenal tactics. Oni Emery has stumbled on a really good system in the Europa League that gets the best out of Lacazette and Aubameyang. That of course is the 3-4-1-2. The interesting side for Arsenal is that the number 10 position could have been filled by a better player if injuries and of course the issue with Henrik Mkhitaryan hadn't taken place. I would have expected Emery to go with someone like an Aaron Ramsey who did a really good job on Jorginho in the previous league game, but an alternative could have been Henrik Mkhitaryan. Could have played the same aggressive pressing role, good work rate, but also on the counter-attack would have been good. So it's going to have to be Ozil in that number 10 position. The other option for Emery would be someone like an Awobi, who would be physical, would be able to you know, break the play down, but going forward there's still question marks about his decision making. So expect the German number 10 to play behind Lacazette and Aubameyang. A key way to getting behind Chelsea, of course, is playing behind their centre-backs. In terms of Lacazette and Aubameyang, it's going to be vitally important for them to make those runs in behind and pin back the Chelsea defence, which consequently will open up space for Ozil to dictate the play. Other selection problems for Unai Emery and Arsenal potentially could be at centre-back. Does he go with Socrates, Koscielny and, of course, the main man, Mustafi, or throw in Monreal? I'd probably rather see Monreal at the back offers a little bit more stability at left centre-back. He's played that position over the last two seasons and done really well, and it does give you that extra ability to deal with Willian if he's on the dribble. But, as expected, Mustafi will start the game. Wingbacks are going to be vitally important for Arsenal. Kolasinac on the left-hand side and Maitland-Niles on the right-hand side could be the key to opening up this game. Lucas Torreira is going to be vitally important in the transition. Not only pressing high, but dropping back and dealing with Eden Hazard if he looks to cut inside onto his favourite right foot. But Arsenal, three at the back, four in midfield and one behind two centre-forwards. So let's dive into the key battles for the Europa League final. We're going to be looking at three key areas. That, of course, is Arsenal's front two up against Chelsea's back two, the attacking midfielder versus the defensive midfielder, and, of course, the right-hand side for Arsenal and the left-hand side for Chelsea. That is where the game is going to be won and lost. First up, let's talk about Chelsea going forward. The player that we mentioned before is Eden Hazard, who likes to come inside when he's on the ball. He likes to dribble into areas where you, you know, want to get him onto his right foot and look to get shots. For Arsenal, what they need to do is they need to double up on him, they need to slow him down. Someone like Lucas Torreira, who we mentioned before, is going to be vitally important in blocking off that central channel. You should look to foul Hazard before he gains momentum, but also put key crunching tackles in him early doors to set that tempo in a defensive sense. 
I'd argue that someone like a Socrates could be vitally important for this. Socrates is quite good when he comes out and defends in an aggressive manner, which, you know, you could also got the two centre-halves sort of being a little bit more narrow on that left-hand side of the pitch, which would allow someone like Socrates to join the battle with Lucas Torreira on, of course, Eden Hazard. The other side of Chelsea's left-hand side that's good, the strengths, is Marcus Alonso entering the final third. He scored and assisted in Chelsea's 3-2 win over the Gunners earlier on the season at Stamford Bridge. For me, when, when you see teams that deal with him well, it's when there's someone up against him. We've seen Antonio Valencia do it for Manchester United under Jose Mourinho. They stuck to him, they tracked him forward and back, and that's something I think Maitland-Niles could do. If Alonso looks to make a forward run into the final third, Maitland-Niles needs to drop back and make a back five shape. Of course, with the other sort of left wing back cutting inside as well. Alonso's danger is in that final third. Jorginho put a really good ball over the top for the opening goal at Stamford Bridge. That's something that Arsenal need to be aware of. If Alonso makes that forward run, somebody needs to track him, and that man is Maitland-Niles. Also, in an attacking sense, it could be really interesting for Arsenal to push down that uh, right-hand side. Maitland-Niles, really, really good on the ball. We saw that assist that he got against Valencia, the skill on Guardes, and the whip ball across to Abemiang to fire in on the slide. That's what I'd like to see him do, not only deal with Alonso in a defensive sense, but run at him. Alonso isn't the best defender. If Chelsea do want to go for the defensive option, Emerson is the guy, but in terms of Alonso, I think you've got to play him for his forward ability in that final third. He's been directly involved in more goals than any Premier League defender since he joined Chelsea. But maitland has got a job to do. That area though, right hand side for Arsenal, left hand side for Chelsea, is going to be the first key battle. Next up, we've got to talk about the battle between Jorginho and Mesut Ozil. The sides, playmakers, the big thing for when you beat Chelsea is you've got to deal with Jorginho. You've got to pressurise him. You've got to stop him playing. Because if you stop Jorginho, you stop Chelsea. You stop that connection from defence to midfield in Jorginho to Eden Hazard. Ozil has a defensive responsibility that he's got to do well for Unai Emery. Because as soon as he doesn't do that, he'll get hooked. And maybe Danny Welbeck could come on to do a similar job. In an attacking sense, it's all about getting behind Jorginho. We saw Anchang Frankfurt do that really well for their goal at Stamford Bridge. Good combination play. Luka Jovic played him behind from that position getting behind Jorginho and exploiting that sort of position. And finally, let's talk about the centre forwards. Lacazette and Abemiang were directly involved in all seven goals that they scored against Valencia in the semi-finals. And they were fantastic at pulling back the Valencia defence. Thinking Lacazette into the channel with Abemiang. Perfect stuff for Arsenal Football Club. If they can force Chelsea's back four into a deeper position, uh, when they've got the ball in the centre of the pitch, it's going to open up space for Ozil in between the lines. But also, in Chelsea's medium block, when they sit on the halfway line, if you look for the balls over the top, into the channels, you're going to catch them out. David Luiz is like a headless chicken when he's defending the channels, and Jorginho isn't very good when he's been turned defending that cutback area. Arsenal created chance after chance after chance in the two games in the Premier League from cutbacks from the right-hand side or the left-hand side, and that's what the two centre forwards can do. One can pull wide, the other one can receive the cutback. That's how Arsenal can beat Chelsea in the Europa League final. Can Arsenal get back into the Champions League? Will Unai Emery be playing in the Europa League once again next season? It's the last game for Czech and Danny Welbeck. Can they make an impact? Eden Hazard could be off to Madrid. Sorry to Turin. There's too many questions to be answered, but subscribe to the Squawk YouTube channel for the preview for the Champions League final on Squawker Tactics. Make sure, of course, to subscribe if you're new. Like that goddamn video. See you later.